Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Kenan's Cutting Edge. My name is Jenna Labor, and I will be your host as we explore the dynamic world of Don Keenan's trial philosophy, The Cutting Edge. Those of you joining us live this afternoon have the opportunity to ask questions and interact with our speaker, who today is going to be me. If you have a question, please type it into the comments section below, and I will be sure to address it. Episodes are released each week following the live broadcast, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and click the alerts icon so you don't miss an episode. So as I mentioned today, I am the speaker and I'm going to kind of just talk. So I want people to ask questions if they come up, okay? So I really encourage you to do that. The, the reason I wanted to do this episode was, well, we didn't have anybody scheduled for today, but I also just tried a case, uh, ended last Wednesday was when we got the verdict. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a blowout, but it wasn't great. And so I wanted to, to share that with this particular audience because, you know, we have so many people come on here who have stellar verdicts and i mean that's what edge is about right the edge allows us to do that because it makes us such better attorneys and it makes us able to get much better results for our clients uh, and so we love to celebrate those things and we did do one episode on losses and lessons learned but you know they weren't in real time and so i wanted to do a real time one when the wound is still fresh or my pride is still a little bit hurt and while we're still kind of sorting through the aftermath, uh, because I think it's important to bring that out, right? Yeah, I think we see on listservs all the time, oh, I did this, that, the other, and it went so well for me. But what about when it doesn't go quite as well as you wanted it to go? So I wanted to kind of be open to talking about that because I want more people to be able to do that. Not because I want to create an atmosphere where it's good to not have a good outcome, but because just sometimes things happen and sometimes the case doesn't go your way. And sometimes it's, it's any number of things or any combination of things that didn't go right. And it's important to try to parse through that. I, I think, um, you know, interestingly, my, my dad's watching this Hulu special about Tom Brady. I don't know if any of you who are watching watch football, but those of you who do probably feel a certain type of way about Tom um, but it's called Man in the Arena, and I was at their house for Easter and happened to catch an episode with him, and it was the one about their 2007 season. So anybody who follows the Patriots or even knows much about football know about that 2007 perfect season until the Super Bowl, right? And it was really interesting to see Tom dissect that season. And it resonated with me because he had done all the preparation. He'd done all the work. They had won every game. They did everything they were supposed to do. And it still didn't turn out right. And I thought, wow, this is some kind of sign or whatever you believe in because I felt that way about my trial. I had done everything I possibly could. And, you know, the jury, S-H-A-T, all over us. So it was it was very uh, telling. And one thing that was really interesting about Tom's discussion about it, it wasn't like, well, that happened to us and oh, boo hoo and that kind of thing. It was like, you know, yeah, there was a moment of severe depression and being upset and allowing those emotions to kind of work through you. But you get up Monday morning, you watch the tape, you analyze the plays, you figure out what happened and you try to learn from that. Because even if it feels like there's nothing else you could have done, you were ready, you were 100% on point, it went wrong, figure out what it was. Maybe shouldn't have taken the case in the first place. Maybe got to get better at jury selection. Maybe there was a sign somewhere that you missed where even mid-trial, it was a good idea to go back to the negotiations table. It could have been a bunch of different things. Um, and so I, I'm, that's what I'm kind of trying to work through even now is what can I learn from this experience? Can I learn something? Um, even though after the fact, I was like, wow, we did everything we possibly could. It couldn't have gone any better. And we still ended up where we were. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background about the case, right? Too much intro. Let's, let's get to the meat of it. 
um, essentially we, our client was, um, a 65 year old woman when she was rear ended in a first crash, she was 66 rear ended in a second crash about a year, a little over a year apart. Um, and she had concussions in both, which developed into permanent uh, post concussive syndrome, lost her job, kind of all these things happened. Um, as you notice, I am talking about the plaintiff and many of you are probably thinking, oh, that's where you went wrong. This has got to be a system failure. You can't be focusing on your client, all of those things. We'll get into that. But I wanted to give you kind of the basics of, of the situation. The other thing about our client, um, so she's, she's older, right? To me, 65 doesn't seem old, but to a lot of people, it does. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind as the age of your client kind of matters, right? And how do, does the average person look at your client um, as their age and their health status. Our client had some pre-existing conditions. She had, um, as most women in their 60s, have fibromyalgia. It, it, during the time when these women were being diagnosed with fibromyalgia, it was kind of a catch-all diagnosis. So I'll, I see a lot of women coming through uh, our office who have this diagnosis in their file, just lingering because medical providers are too tired to listen to complaints. And so they, they would use this fibromyalgia catch-all diagnosis. That's changing, which is good, but it doesn't help some of our clients who, who still have this lingering diagnosis in their, um, in their medical records. And in addition to it being something that was a catch-all for a lot of people, it carries a stigma, right? It carries that stigma of somebody who complains about everything and just you know, it, it's kind of psychosomatic in the way a lot of people think about fibromyalgia when they hear that word. So we had, um, you know, her age was a, a factor, her existing conditions were a factor. She had been di self-diagnosed with um, being on the autism spectrum prior to the crashes. And in in her description of that, it, it made her see herself in a different light and was actually an asset. She was an elementary school teacher and she felt it was an asset that she had self-diagnosed herself on the spectrum, um, not only because it helped her understand herself better, but it also allowed her to communicate better with her students. Uh, she had been on medications. There were interesting statements she'd made in her medical records to her providers, even after the crashes talking about different things causing her, her irritability and whatnot. Um, so we had, we had several kind of issues. I call them comorbid comorbidities of a case, right? You know, in addition to what she was dealing with because of the crashes, there were some other things going on. So initially, uh, let's talk about the process of the case. Initially, we set it up to settle, but the defendants had a lot of insurance, right? They had combined, there were, because, if you recall, I mentioned that there was a first crash and a second crash. Uh, combined, they had over $2.5 million in specials, or excuse me, in um, uh, coverage. So there was essentially no chance in hell that they were going to let this case go for anything that we felt was a reasonable number. So, you know, we went through mediation, did a full mediation workup, full presentation, uh, you know, did the whole thing and, and didn't get very far. That mediation happened in 2020, I believe. I think it was the end of 2020 or early 2021. This case was originally supposed to go to trial in 2020 in the fall. Um, it got continued four times. Uh, you know, I, I honestly today feel a little bit of relief that we at least have gotten through it because it's been hanging over my head for so many years. Um, but Anyways, so we set it up to settle. It was not going to settle. So I started gearing it up for trial. Well, we always gear it up for trial from the outset, but you know what I mean? You kind of like kick it into higher gear. And every time the case would get continued, I would do more work and more work and more work. We did three full day adversarial focus groups. Uh, the, each one was very similar in the outcome. I tweaked things each time. Uh, the first time I did it, kind of with my first uh, theories, I guess, knowing what I knew from mediation, what I had learned from the defense, I put all that on the table. Um, and we got, I think we got our highest adversarial focus group uh, verdict of $2 million on that one. 
the I they had several you know there's a lot of feedback right and so I worked out uh, that feedback and I also brought in a lot more witnesses so I brought in a witness for every issue like I had 14 witnesses I was going to put on right and I, I was like, okay, every issue the defense has, I'm going to nail it with this person, that person. And, and they're going to be shocked because I'm bringing in like the uh, Washington Education Association union representative. I'm bringing in, you know, the emergency room doctors. I'm bringing in everybody. So there, there's not going to be a question about anything in this case. So I put that in front of the adversarial focus group and we got a $1 million response. Um, and so they... Um, so getting a $1 million response, I was like, oh, they didn't like all those witnesses. And that was true. They didn't like the witnesses. Um, and so we cut it down, put it up in front of the adversarial focus group again, and got a $1.5 million verdict out of that for a focus group. So we, um, we were right in the ballpark, right? One to two, one, uh, 1.5. And I practiced my ask multiple times because I, I had a trial years and years ago before the edge where... I um, asked a large number. <laughs> I've never asked for seven figures before, but I asked a large number and the jury punished me for it. So I always wanted to make sure ever since then I test the ask, I make sure it's not too much. My ask at trial was $2.8 million. It didn't offend anybody in the focus groups. We always got the between one and 2 million total. So even um, our Buffett numbers were on point there. We did Buffett numbers. We did um, even the people who are watching the trial, they were lockstep. Everybody was coming up with the same numbers, same numbers <laughs> between one and $2 million. Um, I did several other focus groups as well. I had uh, an MOI animation made, um, a mechanism of injury. So I, I had a full on animation of the car being hit, the way the, the client's body moved in the crash, um, the way her brain moved in her skull, and then also um, the areas of the brain that were damaged corresponding to her complaints, right? So I did all that. Um, I made sure, uh, and I did three focus groups just on that MOI animation alone. Uh, if you guys recall, Papa Don gave a cautionary tale back in December when we talked to him about life care plans, right? Don't just put a life care plan in front of a jury. Make sure you've walked it through with a focus group to make sure you're not uh, asking for things that don't make sense. So I did that, um, put it, put, I put my actual, I actually, my third adversarial focus group, I had all the actual witnesses come in, like my real witnesses. I even paid the experts to do it. Um, there was no sign at any time during the preparation and the testing of all of this evidence that a jury would not give us the full specials or the commensurate general damages. So how I approached this trial um, I knew that they would go neuropsych because in Washington, everybody uses, brings a neuropsych to a brain injury case. And so they did, they brought on a neuropsych. So I went on it, it went in and got a neurologist. We had had her evaluated by two neuropsychologists, but there were issues with those witnesses. They, um, one of them had a bad deposition and decided never to work with lawyers again. And then the other one was confused about what she could testify to as a treating provider. Cause we had, kind of brought her on as a treater to actually develop a relationship with our client. And um, I see I see the question that's pending. I am getting to it. Matthew Nagel wants to know the outcome. I am getting it to it. <laughs> I promise you'll know. Um, but that's the thing. I mean, we even talked about just before this, everybody wants to know the outcome, right? And the outcome's important, but the process is just as important, if not more so, right, to understand how we got to where we are today. So that's why, kind of why I'm walking through a lot of this stuff. So anyways, we, we were bunk on our neuropsychs, even if we wanted to use them. So I used a neurologist who was massively credentialed and, you know, Stanford trained and decades of experience. And she was, you know, very, very well credentialed and, and, and whatnot. Um, personality was a little bit difficult. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well when um, deciding who to present the information that you need presented. Um, so in mediation, we learned that they would be basing their case on the claim that plaintiff didn't ever have a concussion, not in either crash. So she was diagnosed in the emergency room after, either, after both crashes with concussion. Defense was gonna come in and say that those diagnoses were wrong. 
and all of the subsequent diagnoses of concussion, brain injury, or post-concussive disorder were uh, as a result of those incorrect original diagnoses, right? Kind of the cut and paste argument, even though, I mean, nobody cuts and pastes the anything from the emergency room providers' uh, records. But anyways, so that was their that was their argument. Um, so I did hunt down the ER doctors and I did bring them in. Focus groups liked them and appreciated hearing that very short. We kept it short. We didn't have them go on and on. We just had them establish their criteria, their experience, their the criteria they use in the ER, and then um, how they applied it to our client. So that way, that argument was kind of out and uh, mitigated. We also had my client's primary care physician talk about the accommodations she required at work after these crashes. That was significant because our client had been a, an elementary school teacher for 46 years. And after the, no issues, she had one letter of direction in her file over 46 years of teaching. Um, after these crashes, she was an absolute nightmare. She had all kinds of problems with interpersonal relationships with colleagues, challenges managing students all kinds of things. We had our primary care uh, doctor testify to all of that because she was the one who certified medically time off work, accommodations, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, we had the neurologist talk about the diagnostic criteria for post-concussive syndrome, why she needed a life care plan, why she was not medically released to work even today. We had a voc counselor who um, he actually was on board. He was clinical. He was on board with her since 2018, going to the medical appointments, helping her make them, um, helping her with the accommodations at work, setting up the accommodations, making sure she was using her FMLA and whatnot to appropriately get time off work. He's also a life care planner, so he did the he put the medical provider's recommendations for future treatment into a life care plan. Um, and we periodically checked in with that life care plan to make sure that it was re accurately reflecting her ongoing needs and we weren't asking for too much and that sort of thing. Um, since the defense was going on about how she had no uh, objective and measurable cognitive deficits, I went the route of showing that she had a personality change. So they went neuropsych. I brought in a neurologist. They said there was no concussion. I brought in the people to show that there was. And then finally, um, they were talking about no measurable cognitive deficits. I, I went the route of saying, listen, brain injury doesn't, have, it's not always neurocognitive deficits. And, and that's important. That's where you need to know the medicine more than the doctor. So I spent a ton of time researching this. I read the DSM-5 and what they were claiming to base their diagnoses on. I did tons of research on diagnostic criteria. I, you know, I, I learned that medicine really, really well. And that helped develop this theory of the case where it's, it's her personality change, right? So we had three before and after witnesses come in, colleague um, from her teaching years, a friend who ran the dog club she was part of and her brother. So we had, they were diverse. They had, uh, they knew different areas of my client's life and they all could testify to the before and after. Um, and along that same line, because I was really trying to show that she had frontal lobe damage and, and personality change, kind of the no filter executive functioning type stuff a lot more than these cognitive issues people tend to associate with brain injury. I made sure my mechanism of injury animation was um, showed that, right? Showed the damage to the frontal lobe, showed what the frontal lobe does, and then corresponded it to her complaints. So during trial, the defense called their neuropsychologist and a physiatrist. So the physiatrist, was interesting because I realized after reading her report and again going to the text of the DSM-5 and the other criteria she claimed to be basing her opinions on that her criteria that she based her opinions on were wrong. They were completely made up. They were absolutely fabricated, probably, probably pieced together from her memory of what various texts use um, as diagnostic criteria. Um, so I highlighted that in my cross-examination of her. And, and that's another point too, is make sure you know the diagnostic criteria that, and the basis for these um, alleged expert opinions, because sometimes they don't know 
what they're doing and they don't they're using the wrong criteria or whatever they're saying they're relying on is not something they should be relying on or whatever that criteria might be shouldn't be used in a forensic situation there's a lot of things you can use there in cross examination um and we, we drew that out and, and she started fighting the criteria itself, saying she knew better than those authorities. And, you know, I would never diagnose based on that, but these are the criteria that should be used. So, I mean, in my mind, things are going fine, right? I mean, I'm using my edge cross exam that Benji taught me. I'm using uh, all of the things that I, I'm like, this is going super well. Um, I mean, I've got my inspiration from Mindy on doing my mechanism of injury animation. I even had a timeline uh, of, of, um, of symptoms printed out or put up in slides. I wasn't able to use it. Judge wouldn't let me. But, uh, you know, I, I was kind of doing these things that I felt were, were putting this case on a good, um, on a good trajectory. So um, this King County jury and... King County in, in Washington is, is in Seattle. It encompasses Seattle as well as some of the surrounding areas. And it's a very kind of liberal tech oriented area, politically liberal um, tech oriented area. This jury needs facts and figures. They do not have empathy. They had, and, and, you know, we knew this ahead of time, but we gave them a ton of facts and figures. We gave them a ton of evidence. Um, unfortunately, they believed the, as soon as the neuropsych on the other side said he did objective testing, <clears throat> which of course, I mean, our, our witnesses were talking about subjective complaints, <clears throat> excuse me, subjective complaints. Um, they, they believed that. You know, they talked about that it, after the fact when I was debriefing with them. They were like, well, their neuropsych did objective testing. So, you know, think, knowing your audience, knowing your jury, knowing who's going to be there and what they need uh, is really important. We did, you know, we knew this was a hazard of being in a very liberal, very tech oriented um, area. And we thought we were bringing our A game. Um, this jury happened to find a hole where they thought, um, you know, there was a difference. So I preconditioned the, this jury actually during trial about the number I was going to be asking for by telling them during voir dire that I'd be asking about it. I told them I'm going to be asking for millions. million. Does anybody have a problem with that? We actually had a lot of people stricken for cause because they said that they would never consider it because they preferred forgiveness over money damages. <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, a lot of people were like, where's the forgiveness? Where's the forgiveness? I'm like, okay. What? This is like the twilight zone. Um, I also preconditioned them to my exact number that I'd be asking during my opening because my statistic happened to be, and this is a total fluke, happened to be the same. So my statistic was 2.8 million brain injuries happen in the U.S. every year. Um, and my the numbers ended up adding up to 2.8. So ultimately, um, in my closing, um, which we'll talk about what went wrong after this section of kind of what the workup was. But ultimately, I asked for lost wages, which were $350,000. I asked for her life care plan, which ranged from $400 to $475,000, just based on how long they thought she'd be living and what they thought she'd be needing. And, and then I asked for $2 million in general damages. So that's approximately this 2.8 that I've been testing for months, and I even preconditioned them on and everything else. Defense asked for 50,000 to 60,000 total between two defendants. So I think they each wanted like to pay 25 to $30,000. Uh, the jury came back after three or three and a half hours of deliberations with $201,800. So that was interesting. Um, it was very interesting because of the process that they walked us through and how they got there um it, you know some people might, might be out there thinking well it's way more than what the defense asked for you should be celebrating <sighs> i wish but they had actually given us an offer of judgment of just over three hundred thousand dollars the week before trial so in washington the defense can do an offer of judgment which i think in other places they might be called offers of compromise or whatnot but it's essentially here's the amount we're willing to pay now if you you know take it or there's a consequence if you don't beat it at trial 
fortunately, the consequence is very, very minimal in Washington. It's like $200 of attorney's fees and some very nominal costs. So, you know, but only the defense can do this. The plaintiff does not have the opportunity to make one of these. And specifically, it's a, it's a tort reform thing we have here where it says, you know, we don't want plaintiffs pursuing frivolous trials, right? So again, fully rooted in tort reform, all that stuff. Um, so while yes, we did beat their ask at trial by quite a bit, and, and I, the jury felt like they had made nobody happy. That was what the foreman ended up saying. He's like, we hope nobody's happy. You know, they, they thought they kind of split the baby in a reasonable way. It, it's not quite as simple as that kind of in, in the background. So um, what went wrong? Several, I think several things. And this is what I've spent the last week and a half or so really kind of combing over. Because again, I mean, I walked you guys through what we did. We worked so hard. I was obsessed with this case. I, I worked it to death. Maybe I worked it too hard. Maybe I was the New England Patriots and I was like, I've done so much work and everything is perfect. And it's, I just got to stick to the game plan and it will be fine. And then the Giants come in and, and a losing team and kick my butt. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's been really hard, but I want to share kind of my process on, on some of the things that logistically went wrong during trial and then kind of my, my takeaways on that. Uh, Matthew Nagel, I hope I answered your question about the result of the trial there. Thanks for hanging in. All right. Um, so the first thing that I, I kind of expected this to happen, um, we had a judge who didn't know civil law. And, and I'm not saying like, this is a judge who doesn't do civil law very often. This is a judge who said on the record many, many times, sorry, uh, sorry, everybody, I don't know civil law. So uh, I'm just going to like make a decision here. I, many times she would say that. And this not only during trial, but like pre-trial. So I knew that she needed a lot of help, right? And that's one thing we talk about in EDGE the judge is not your problem, right? You have to be the one to educate that judge and bring them up to speed and get them there, right? That's our job. So I took that to heart. I briefed everything extensively. I told her uh, we need to do motions and limine well in advance of the trial because there are a lot of them and there are some odd issues in this case. She refused. Um, I said, we should talk about jury instructions early on. She said, no, um, I tried to get, I, I tried, I filed a motion uh, for summary judgment on some issues. She heard it, but didn't make any substantive real decisions. She's like, let's just let the jury sort it out, that sort of stuff. So, you know, I tried um, to really educate this judge, but you can lead a horse to water, right? Can't make them drink. So the morning of motions eliminate comes around and the court's like, wow, I had no idea this case was so complicated. I think coming from a criminal background, a lot of judges think civil law is simple. It's, it's just a car crash, a couple car crashes. Like how difficult can it be? How complex can it be? But we all know that it's massively complex. There are so many evidentiary issues that go into these cases, medical records, property damage photos, collateral source, all these things that just don't come in um, and aren't really as big of issues in criminal law. And so that was the first kind of red flag, I guess I would say, um, is really having a judge who didn't know the lay of the land, but also wouldn't learn it. Um, and that was frustrating during motions in limine when she would lean towards a a wrong ruling or ruling that I didn't agree with, I would say, please look at our briefing. I briefed this not only in the motions themselves, but I also supplemented with the trial brief on this. And she just said, I don't have time. I don't have time. And so the appellate courts will have to sort it out if I make the wrong call. Now, the, this judge, I know, I know she was trying her best, right? I'm, I definitely don't want to speak disrespectfully of her because she was in a situation where she was out of her league. But I also felt it was frustrating um, that uh, it was frustrating to hear that right from her that I, I just don't have time to read things. I don't have the ability to get up to speed or, or those sorts of things. So that was hard. 
um, and, and also because I had spent so much time ahead of time knowing she would have this difficulty, you know, I was submitting like a 45 page brief with, with everything that I knew and anticipated what's going to come up. Uh, David Bressman asks, were the members of the focus groups ultimately represented of the actual jurors seated in the case? Very good question. And they, yes. Um, okay, let me back up on that. So we knew that there were a couple of sketchy demographics for us. Women in their 60s were not good. Young men kind of in their 30s were not good. Tech people, never good. Um, men in their 50s and 60s were good. Um, racial makeup, we didn't really have any like solid data on that. It kind of went um, either way. Um, so we had, uh, we did have a man in his 60s. We unfortunately had two women in their 60s. So that was bad. Um, we had two men in their 30s and they, we had tech people. Now, so is that something that I can learn from the future, right? I mean, we, we got so many people kicked for cause. We got a lot of, we struck, we used all of our peremptories and we still ended up with that type of jury. So is that a point at which we reevaluate and say, maybe we go back to the negotiating table? I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe. And so maybe because we knew that we had, because of the focus, and I, you know, that is something that the focus group taught us maybe we should have done something different at that point, right? Once that jury that had some problematic folks on it was seated. But when we talked about it, we thought, well, this is the most, neut most neutral jury of the juries, jurors, excuse me, who were called to the courthouse, the Zoom courthouse um, for that trial. So we figured we could overcome it. Um, the, the, maybe that's another lesson to be learned. <laughs> Can you ever really overcome those demographics when people who fit those demographics tend, and of course it's always a generalization because you can certainly have exceptions, but they tend towards being unfriendly to your case. Um, so that was a challenge as well. Uh, and something that I definitely need to think about in the future is when, when, when you get kind of the downers, the Debbie downers from your focus groups who are on your jury, I don't know, maybe, maybe you take a second look at whether you want to go forward at that point. Um, I think uh, with this jury, the, they had claimed, they said during voir dire that they you know, were open to uh, considering that somebody had a brain injury without pictures. That was something we got a lot of people struck, stricken for cause because they didn't believe there would be brain injury without like a picture of a damaged brain. Um, they would consider a multi-million dollar verdict and that was another thing that got people kicked out for cause. They said they would never consider it under any circumstances. So this, these folks, they, while they had some demographics concerns, the discussions we had with them, you know, their, their thankfulness, all of that stuff was, was fine enough that we felt like, all right, I think, I think this is an okay jury. Um, so yeah, definitely something to think about. Thank you for that question, David. That's a, a good question. Um, excuse me. So getting back to kind of the challenges we had with, or what went wrong, I guess, the judge also turned it into an events case. So <laughs> one of defense counsel looked me up and knew that I was on faculty here at the edge. He might be watching this podcast right now. I don't know. And so he brought a reptile motion completely confused the crap out of the judge. And actually they went about it in a really sneaky way. They, instead of just bringing a reptile motion or a lizard motion, as we've seen in the past, um, which judges won't really rule on because they're confused by it and don't understand what it's asking for. They made it about, can't say community safety, can't say safety rules, can't say, can't talk about those things. This is a damages only case. And so the court Excuse me, it's different being the one who's talking the whole time. Ooh. So the court, instead of being confused by the reptile thing and saying, let's just see what happens with the evidence, you know, counsel don't do golden rule, she went through and systematically hacked out all of these phrases. Um, being a woodpecker, you don't stop when the judge does that. You need to find different ways of doing it. So we, we did, um, but it was, the judge was harsh on that. We couldn't say um, accountability, 
full responsibility, any of those things, which even in a um, admitted liability damages only case, you usually, you're usually allowed to say. And these are the things that I briefed extensively in my trial brief that the court felt she didn't have time to go back and really look at. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, what I always say, there's issues for appeal, there's, you know, wrong decisions were made, you know, the fight's not over, but it became an events case. It became a true, true, true events case. Um, and I think uh, to David's point about the focus group issue, that was a big difference between what we presented to this jury and what we presented to the focus groups. Because in the focus groups, we did, uh, we had more of an events case. We'd set it up, even though it was admitted liability, to talk about things like deterrence, conscience of the community, community safety, and things like that. So, you know, I mean, is that another point where you reevaluate whether you should continue on at trial? Do you say, oh, the court has stripped us of all this stuff? um that really was giving us our good numbers before and you call it a day in this case we 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 didn't we didn't period end of story we didn't and and I don't know if it was something that I would do in the future because I think um this client wanted her day in court she you know wanted to pursue the trial and so um you know yeah. Anyways, another good question or a good thought about uh, the focus groups and how it translated into trial. Are you actually able to put on the same evidence? And if not, what's that going to look like? I mean, is that really going to drag you down? So, okay. So the judge being kind of difficult and not really wanting to kind of get up to speed. She also allowed in collateral source, which was very frustrating um, I, she was very deferential to the defense to the point of like coaching them on how to do their cross examinations of our witnesses, um, within the confines of her rulings, you know, there, it was, um, the judge was certainly against us. And I'm not saying that as an excuse because it's not an excuse because at the end of the day, it's our job to convey to the jury what we need to convey to them, despite whatever rulings the judge makes, but it certainly made things very difficult. And um, it's, it's just me and Young G in the firm. We have a, a paralegal, but he doesn't do litigation with us in real time. So some things that you might be able to send back to your larger office and say, all right, put this in the think tank. What does everybody think? Um, let's, let's brainstorm it. We don't necessarily have that option because we are like, you know, in trial, both of us at all times. Um, and so, you know, we use the nights and the evenings to like debrief and think about things. But there is that element as well, being a tiny firm. Um, and can we always pivot exactly as we need to, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. We had a Zoom trial. I don't know if folks are wondering about the uh, merits or demerits of Zoom. I, I loved it. I loved doing it. Uh, but I don't think a Zoom trial did us any favors. In person, your jury bonds. They get to go to lunch together. They talk about things, learn about each other, form relationships. Um, on Zoom, they don't get that opportunity, right? During lunch, they log off, or in, in our situation, they were put into a breakout room and turned off their cameras and microphones. Um, but um, so they didn't have the opportunity of chatting and talking and becoming invested in each other or in the case. This jury only deliberated for three and a half hours. It's, I think, the shortest deliberation we've ever had. Um, no, no, there was one pre-edge years ago, my very first trial. The only reason they deliberated for two hours is because they wanted the court's pizza before they poured us out completely. Um, that was very sad. But again, it's another, um, another events case with a plaintiff and individual um, defendant. So um, I'm not going to say that Zoom is a problematic platform because if we were in person, would the same thing have happened? I don't know, it might have, absolutely. But I think for our jury, uh, it certainly didn't help. So that's all I'll say on Zoom is it didn't help in this situation because it didn't allow for that bonding and that sort of thing. Um, and I know that, uh, Dawn has done a lot of research into the Zoom format and how it, you know, kind of all across the country it has been used. And, you know, I don't, I think the, if I remember correctly, the ultimate outcome was it's not a huge difference, right? If you're, if you're selling it, if you're doing it right, then um, it, it's not going to kill you. And I would agree with that. 
It's not going to kill you. I think it didn't help. And I think we needed all the help that we could get <laughs> during this trial. So, you know, it, it would have been interesting to try it again in, in person. Um, another issue is we had two defendants, right? I had to bring, um, uh, the, you know, I had, we had indivisible injuries. She hadn't healed from her first crash injuries before the second crash happened. And then those same injuries kind of compounded. So I, I think that can cut both ways. Um, with corporate defendants, when you have multiple, then it can be a David and Goliath situation. Here, I really felt like, and I didn't, this is something I didn't think about ahead of time because I felt like it was going to be a David and Goliath situation situation just because we had two defendants. But I think it was the other way around where I was, you know, taking on the community. I was taking on multiple people. Um, and then also that they had double the time with the jury during voir dire. They had double the strikes, double the opportunities for direct and cross-examination, two openings, two closings. They got to drive home their points like over and over and over again. In their case, their defenses were simple. Um, you know, trying to convince a jury that your client is a different person today than she was, you know, three years ago is a little bit more complex. Um, well, I didn't think it was complex, but apparently it is. <laughs> so anyways, um, so that I think drowned us out a little bit. It was kind of us fighting against this very loud noise of uh, two defendants bringing some of this, like essentially the same arguments. And they were in lockstep. We didn't have a situation where they were fighting each other. They were in lockstep. It was them against us. Um, so two defendants was a challenge. I would I would take on two defendants any day if they were corporations. Two individuals, it's it's tough. It's tough. And we know Mindy does the POV video and does an excellent job explaining in car crashes. Your jury is putting themselves in the position of the defendants. So, you know, we've got that, you're in a hole, and then it's two against one. So it's it's a recipe for some serious challenges. Um, so we, we know another thing to always keep in mind that everybody should keep in mind is juries don't follow jury instructions. They follow bubble law. And I've watched enough adversarial focus groups um, deliberating to know that those jury instructions, once they're read by the judge, they're never opened again. Um, you might have one person who's a very rules rules oriented person who's like, hey, we should check out what proximate cause means before we make this decision. It, it doesn't, it, they're confusing, they're boring, and they've already made up their mind anyways. So our job is to know what that bubble law is and for our case to bring that law to them. Well, here, we weren't really allowed to do that because of the, there was no law that somebody broke and had, you know, we talked about, yeah, you're not supposed to crash into other cars. You're supposed to, you know, all the, the we talked about the system of driving on the freeway and how that failed but it was drowned out by so many other things. It wasn't, um, and because we couldn't talk about how that impacted the community and how their verdict would impact the community or future conduct, um, it was just kind of a byline that they heard in passing. So they didn't follow the jury instructions, which again is not a surprise, but unfortunately they didn't follow them in the defense's favor instead of not following them in our favor, right? If they're not gonna follow the rules, fine, but at least do it in our favor. Um, and the, the biggest one that they had a problem with was proximate cause. They did understand in, in Washington, our proximate cause, um, we don't have foreseeability in any of our jury instructions, which is odd, but we do have a really good proximate cause instruction. And it says the, the crash or the incident or whatever it may be, only needs to be a proximate cause. So I hammered that. I mean, like hammered it. I was like, if you believe that her pre-existing conditions had something to do with it, that's okay because the crash is only need to be a cause. If you believe that her change in medication, you know, after the crashes was a cause, that's okay because the crashes only need to be a cause. Um, and and they did find, they did find that the that she had concussion. They believed the brain injury, and they did find that she had that that injury was a proximate cause of her need to retire which was huge, her need for future medical care, which was also huge, and her general damages. The part of the proximate cause instruction they forgot or didn't, I guess, follow was that uh, in Washington, if you do find there, that it is a proximate cause, then it's not a defense that any other, any other anything might have also been a proximate cause. So once you find 
crash is already caused, boom, plaintiff gets everything. I think, I think rather than not following it, I think they understood it. They didn't want to do it. They didn't like it. Um, the foreman said he had a problem with the burden of proof. He did not like that it only had to be 51% or whatever. Um, so I think they had a problem with the instructions. So, you know, uh, foreseeable problem somewhat, because we know that they don't follow them, but they kind of created a hostile bubble law that was problematic. Um, and so, you know, appealable issues, right? That's what we always talk about. Um, let's see. I, and I also truly believe when Don always tells us, you got to get them in the first four minutes, otherwise they're lost to you. I don't know if I, ha I think I had them in the four first four minutes, but I lost them somewhere pretty soon thereafter. I definitely lost them um, somewhere early in the case because the feedback they were giving after the fact was all filtered through this very defense oriented lens. And, and maybe I never had them, to be honest. I have to leave room for that because they were the stuff, the things that they talked about in debriefing were, um, it was as if they had shut their brain off after like one of the, one of the first witnesses and stopped listening, except to hear things that reinforced the defense point of view or what they believed it was going to be. Um, I have to give credit to the defense lawyers in this case. They, I think they're black hats because of how they handled pre-trial stuff and whatnot. They brought it and they did a, they did a good job in Bordier. It was not your typical, can you be impartial? Will you wait until after the plaintiff's case to be open-minded to the defendant's case? No, they did real voir dires. Um, they did, you know, a, a real openings. They, I, I don't know if they have gone to edge colleges. I hope not. But, you know, they had, you know, they, they were people, right? And, and a lot of the times we can differentiate ourselves from defense counsel by being the personable plaintiff's lawyer, the likable plaintiff's lawyer. Um, I think the, one of the defense lawyers, if I had been just against her, it wouldn't have been quite as stark, but the, the male defense lawyer was very likable, goofy, annoying as hell. And they loved him, you know, they loved him. So that's, you know, just another thing to, that was interesting to see because he, prior to all this, he'd just been obnoxious and, and super rude. And then he turns on this charm that I've never seen from, I was like, Paul, who are you? I kind of like you, you know, it was, it was disturbing, but anyways, um, it, it, they did bring their A game and they did, uh, bring a good case that clearly was at least effective in part. Um, and that's why I do think at some point early on, uh, we lost them and they filtered everything that thereafter through that kind of defense lens. Um, I know that there is, um, mixed advice about whether to talk to the jury after trial, win or lose. I usually only do it if they want to stay and I do it purely out of respect for them. Um, I ask questions, I hear what they have to say, but I, I always know that one of the cardinal rules and what Don has always taught us is that they don't really know why they made the decision they made. It's you know, what they're telling you after the fact is an excuse or justification because they don't want to hurt your feelings. I, actually, that's not true. We, one of the jurors wanted to hurt my feelings very bad and he made it personal. So that was very awkward. You have to keep a, a bright face and a receptive, happy, you know, response when jurors come at you personally. But um, that was, so, I, you know, there, it wasn't just, um, you know, there was some kind of weird kind of personality issue as well through the, with this jury. Anyways, I stayed after, put on my big girl pants. Young G stayed with me in case I had to mute myself and she needed to take over. But uh, we talked to them and it, it very, it was clear that they were giving us excuses. Um, they talked about the process of coming to their conclusion, which was, so they, they found that the crashes were approximate cause. They, um, they gave her a little bit of lost wages. They, they made it up because defense didn't put on anything to refute lost wages. So they just kind of made it up. They were like, well, we don't think she would have worked this long anyways. So we decided to cut out some of this and that stick this over here and do this math equation. And boom, here we got her lost wages. Uh, we did find that she needed future medical treatment, but we didn't really understand the, the life care plan. And this is 
this is why I think it was kind of filtered through something that we had irritated them with in the beginning. They said, we wanted, um, we didn't understand if your life care planner created this life care plan and then got doctors to sign off on it, or if the doctors created it and signed off on it, he just kind of put it into a table. Well, we went over this very, very extensively in my direct exam of our life care planner because it was actually a motion in limine that we make sure the jury understood these, these are doctor's recommendations, not our life care planner's recommendations. He simply collected those recommendations and put them in a table. So for the jury to say, we didn't understand that, they, it didn't, it, it got, it went through that filter, right? The filter that they already were kind of off board, didn't really care about it, went right through, right past them. Um, let's see. Um, they also, one of, one of the guys who was super kind and he, when the one guy was being mean to me, this other guy unmuted and said, um, I'd like you to be my lawyer. So that was helpful. That was nice. It helped me a little bit with my ego. But he was saying, you know, we just wanted to hear more about who she was before these crashes. We, five of our 10 witnesses went extensively into that. We had pictures of her family. We had pictures of her doing the things she loved. But we, I mean, okay, if I had brought in 10 witnesses, the way this jury had, was, was going, they would have wanted 15, right? So again, that's kind of an excuse. It's, it's, um, it's something that they're coming back and saying, well, if we had had seven before and after witnesses, maybe we would have had more of a, of a reason to find for you and give more. That's not realistic. That's just a, that's a, that's an excuse. Um, they cut her lost wages. I mentioned they cut the life care plan, even though it, it was undisputed. The oh, non-economic damages was really, really, really tough for this group. And again, I go back to the tech people and I welcome anybody to, I, I want to know more about this, asking for general damages, because I've tried so many different ways. Um, you know, I've tried getting the jury instruction out and saying element by element, and putting a dollar amount by it. Um, I've tried a per diem. One trial, I even tried not giving a number at all of general damages. I gave specials and said, give them what you want. Got to be commensurate kind of a thing. I've tried it so many different ways. And, and I know Papa Don is working on the closing damages section. I, I, I'm so excited for that because that's one thing. And we talked about it all, debriefed all of it, defense counsel included. We're like, there is no real way to ask for general damage, for non-economic damages. It's very, very difficult. You kind of you kind of make up the number, sort of. I mean, we got the number from doing Buffett numbers and focus groups and whatnot, so we didn't pull it out of our ASS, but we, you know, it, it is kind of a made-up number because there is no hard and fast way of doing it. So that was hard for them, um, and so they gave a piddly, piddly, piddly $59,000 in general damages, and it was interesting because when they read that out, the court was shocked. She was like, $59,000? And then he says, yes, your honor. And she says, like, 59000? Zero, zero, zero. Yes, your honor. Okay. All right. So um, again, in Washington, your generals have to be commensurate to your specials. So that's an appe appealable issue. But at the same time, like, I went wrong, right? My, I didn't communicate correctly to this jury how they were supposed to come up with this number. Partly because I don't honestly, I don't know how to do it myself. So anybody, would love to hear feedback on that. Um, hopefully, Papa Don will get his um, the damages part of closing argument so at some point soon. I, I can't wait for that. I know he's going to have the perfect response, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I think uh, in the last few minutes here, I, I see a question: um, if Misty, Misty Borland Pfeiffer has any good appellate points, um, that would be awesome. You know, if if you have appellate points, I am I have actually this afternoon at one thirty a conversation with an appellate attorney to see kind of what we can do to at least kind of maybe a motion for editor or something like that, fit to kind of straighten out some of the glaring errors that occurred. But you know, I as as we say that the jury doesn't really know why they made the decision they made. Can we ever really know what caused the loss? That's something that I've been thinking about. And, you know, not to be too football crazy, but I, um, I, mind you, I haven't watched a professional football game in like three years, but it was a big part of my growing up in another Patriots Super Bowl when they played the Seattle Seahawks, 
the very last play, and this was in 2015, what, um, the Seahawks were down and they were on the one yard line. And it was a matter of t- throwing the ball, passing it or running it. And we had Marshawn Lynch at the time. And so on the one yard line, Marshawn Lynch had a nearly perfect record of getting in the end zone. Um, Pete Carroll and uh, Russell w- Wilson chose to pass. It was intercepted, the Patriots won, and everybody was devastated. And from then on, everybody said, if you'd given the ball to Marshawn, we would have won that game. But is that true? I think our human nature tells us that if you'd made a different decision, a different outcome would have occurred. But the Seahawks were down. They had made so many errors throughout the whole game to put them down in the first place so that they were in this position. Same thing here, you know, any, any combination, any, um, any one thing, two things, three things, combinations of those things could have gone differently. And maybe it would have impacted the outcome. Maybe it wouldn't have. So I think it's not um, fruitful for us to think back and say, oh, I wish I would have done this, wish I would have done that for the purpose of beating ourselves up over what happened, because what happened can't be changed. But I do think to the extent we can look back replay those game reels, look at the, the plays again, talk to people, maybe show the plays to other experts, other people we know. Um, it's, to the extent that we can do that with an open mind and wanting to learn about how to do better in the future, that's where we can still glean some information. Um, and what I learned, what I think so far, again, I'm sharing this with you only a week and a half after it happened, I could not share it with you last week, I was like in shock and kind of sulking. So um, I wanted to do this today while we're still exploring these issues. And I also invite you to think about what we've, I've talked about today and think about your own cases that have had this happen and share with me what you think, how I could have done better. I mean, maybe I'm sharing this and you're like, oh, I would never have done that. What's wrong with you? I want to know about it. Um, but anyways, I have a couple of points that I have come up with over the past week and a half as I've been thinking about it. Um, number one, case selection criteria is there for a reason. And I don't say that glibly. It's so important. Um, this case was not a system failure case. It was two rear end crashes, low property damage, older client, pre existing conditions. Um, could somebody have hit this out of the ballpark? Absolutely the likelihood of that happening was pretty slim given a lot of the various issues in the case. Um, I think in retrospect, I probably wasn't uh, the best case to take to trial, but it was a team decision that was made with the client with her blessing. Um, She didn't feel they were coming to the table with enough during mediation or offers thereafter. And you know, for our, for our part, we needed to get into the courtroom. It had been three years, almost to the day, excuse me, that we um, had been in trial of any sort because everything was getting continued because of COVID. Even Zoom trials were getting continued. So, you know, I wanted to be in there. I wanted to get in there. Um, and, but, you know, this is all hindsight of 2020, right? You reevaluate again next time. The second thing is the use of experts. I don't know, this might be different for other jurisdictions, but in Washington and especially in King County in this kind of very, they identify as very politically far left and very, it's very tech oriented. You, I, I will use experts every time. This case, I went the route of uh, really hunting down the treaters and trying to get the treaters to testify. And it was a massive amount of energy. I, a massive, there was so much pushback. They did not want to testify. They were hostile. They were, you know, um, I ended up getting a few of them kind of turned around. So by the time of trial, they actually liked me and wanted to, you know, fight for their, their patient, but it was brutal. It was so, I mean, there was a lot, it was awful. So I, um, we've had focus groups tell us that they don't see a difference between a treating provider and an expert even if it's the expert that travels all over the country, which we actually don't really see those much here in Washington and state court, um, because they see the, the treater as somebody who's biased as well towards their, their patient. So that's, it's two biases. It's almost as if you have two experts anyways, except an expert actually knows how to testify. 
and isn't going to no show on you or, you know, just be rude or hostile. Um, now, you may be asking, well, if they were hostile, what is wrong with you? Why did you bring them to trial? Well, I actually had an experience in my latter case, which was my superstar case here at Edge, um, that where I had a hostile treater. Oh, he was so hostile. He even told me he was going to change his opinions, even though they were already in his records and he'd already been paid for those uh, for that treatment, and those visits. He was like, I don't care. I'll say the opposite if you make me testify. He ended up being our best witness, best witness. The jury loved him. I ended up loving him. So, you know, I, I, I saw these hostile, um, these hostile providers. I talked to them. I said, I know you're hostile against me because I'm a lawyer and doctors don't like lawyers. We were oil and water. We all know this, but when you get in front of that jury, those are your patients. Those are prospective patients. Talk to them like they're your patients. And so I thought that might work. Worked for some of them, not for all of them. So anyways, that's what I would do. Um, number one, case, case selection criteria, use it. Don't take cases that don't fit it. Or if you do take it, really, really, really consider settling them and using experts. Um, I think the only thing, uh, so the, the, a couple of things, we're a little bit over, but the couple of things that I'm still working on, and I wanna share this just because if you have advice or anything, um, I welcome it. I'm working on figuring out why the focus groups were off. My theory is, as I shared with you, uh, they weren't off. Um, we put, we weren't able to put on that system failure case in front of the jury. And we had those demographics that were not super friendly during the focus group. So that's on me, right? That's on me and needing to get better at dissecting and learning what the focus groups are telling us and how that translates to trial, right? That's really, really key and something I definitely need to get better at. So the focus groups weren't wrong. I was handicapped in the way that I was able to present the case. Therefore, there, they really wasn't translatable, right? That data. Um, I think I want to get better at jury selection. I want to get better. At, we have very limited attorney-led voir dire here in Washington. This case, I had more time than I've ever had. I was able to spend an hour with each panel. We had two panels. Um, that never happens. We normally have 20 minutes, um, 40 minutes total, and then you're done. So get better at jury selection. I really want to keep practicing on that. Um, and then asking for general damages and making sure that my evidence is unimpeachable so that I can use all of it. Cause there was some evidence that we were, we were not able to use. Um, so those are the things I want to work on, get better at welcome input. I welcome assistance. We're here as a community. I hope this debrief has helped someone um, and at least made you feel like it, it doesn't always go well for everybody. And it doesn't always go it, it, well, you know, we didn't get defensed. We didn't get defensed, but there's a lot to be learned um, from sharing experiences that aren't exactly what we thought they would be. So thank you so much for joining me live today on this episode of Fridays with Kenyon's Cutting Edge. If you liked the episode, or even if you didn't, but you like the other ones, please click that thumbs up to feed the YouTube algorithm. And don't forget to subscribe and sign up for alerts so you don't miss an episode. Next week, we're going to continue with our KTI faculty speaker series with Carrie Jones, who will be speaking to us about the Damages College. Carrie is a partner at Dan Kaplis Law, and in addition to being faculty for the Damages College, she also teaches with me on direct exam. I look forward to learning from her next week with all of you. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you next time.